and my microphone was breaking up and I realized it's <laughs> on my beard and they're going, yep. a couple more weeks it'll be gone. All right. All right. It's, just, it's not the microphone, it's operator. the microphone, the operator ear. All right, microphone E. Hey, turn with me in your Bibles to Luke on Sunday. Titus today, that's it. Yes. Titus chapter 2. two. Du. And... Uh, if you go to the St. Paul Winter Carnival, I had a little surprise for Kimberly last night. We went there with the NYG, St. Paul Winter Carnival, and I surprised Kimberly with a happy birthday uh, ice sculpture. And she didn't know it was there, so I sort of said, check this out. It says, happy birthday. It says 40th on it. Uh, they must have got the number wrong, but I said that was for her. Were you surprised, honey? This is a surprise. There you go. All right. I once brought her some flowers saying, get well soon, but um, try to be efficient with everything out there in life. Hey, turn with me in your Bibles to Titus chapter 2. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this, this evening that we can come and study your word and find out how much you love us. And in turn, Lord, we could just love you more and more and more. So Lord, may we leave here tonight more on fire, more convicted, more committed, more submitted, more in love with you than when we came here this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Titus, Titus, again, these are, uh, we're going through uh, the New Testament, finishing it up, uh, the New Testament. We're doing that on Sundays and Thursdays, trying to meet in the middle. So we'll finish up uh, Titus next week. And on Thursday, the 16th, I have a guest speaker here, uh, Trevor Rubenstein from Chosen People uh, Ministries. And for those of you going to Israel with us, you might, uh, you really want to, he's going to have some questions and answers <laughs> Uh, he'll have questions for you. You better come up with answers. No, he'll be there for questions and answers after service. Uh, but that's uh, Thursday the 16th. That'll eventually make it to our website if it doesn't get on there now. But uh, that's for uh, Thursday the 16th. Uh, so uh, we'll finish up Titus next week. But in chapter 2 this week, continuing our study through, um, uh, this uh, Paul encouraging, the, uh, Titus and First and Second Timothy uh, are... They've been affectionately called the pastoral epistles. Um, for those who are desiring to be in the ministry, stand at this pulpit someday with some game. Uh, First and Second Timothy uh, and Titus are good for you. But if you've been listening to Bible radio, you know Pastor Ken Graves is finishing up a series called Mi uh, Master, Mission, and Mate. And part four is, is on this week. Uh, you can go to uh, Calvary Chapel, Bangor, Maine. And uh, get those uh, four series. He does it about every 10 years. And so this is an updated version. And so, and he takes, uh, uh, regardless if you're going to be a pastor or not, uh, just a godly man or woman, uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus, those are should, that's the guy of the book. That's the man of the book. That's the woman of the book. And we're going to get to a couple of those when it comes to characteristics of what we should look for. Um, you know, uh, you're trying to raise your children. I, I looked at First and Second Timothy and Titus. That was my parenting guidebook. These are the values. These are the morals. This is the character that I wanted to put into my sons and my daughters. And so here, uh, I get it. The, again, the Bible is the best uh, 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 commentary on parenting, on how to be a parent, how to raise godly men and women so they can be good old people later, because regardless if you, if you believe it or not, you're going to get older, so you're going to be an old person one of these days, right? So you want to be a good old, so you be a good young person, you're going to be a good old person. Uh, and understand this is the way that, um, put it this way, M my kids, and I would pray that anybody here coming to church, because you're like all my spiritual kids here, my prayer is that um, that you, you, you never fall away from the faith. I prefer that you backslide. That, that's how I went into parenting. I wanted to make sure my children, uh, no one was ever going to say, hey, have you ever heard about this thing called evolution? Uh, have you, in other words, deconstruct their faith. And, and I'll get to that momentarily here. But, and, and try to question all these things. No, when my kids backslid, just like when I backslid, I knew exactly what I was walking away from. No one didn't came to me and says, wow, my parents lied to me. It's evolution. 
Uh, I never got instructed in anything and go, man, the, the pastor lied. My parents lied or none of that. My kids, uh, and you can talk to them. Every one of my kids says, oh yeah, when I turned away from the Lord, I knew exactly what was, I, yeah, no one ever convinced me. I, I wasn't out here doing this thing because, you know, maybe God does exist or maybe he's a man, maybe he's a woman, maybe he's binary or whatever. This, maybe a little confused or any philosophical thing. They know exactly what it is. Because this is the thing that we should be building. And and again, what is happening in this world today, I I, I challenge anyone, even if you do not want to go to heaven and you think being a Christian is too tough, just look at 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. I don't know how any other way that you can instill character and, and morals and values and ethics aside from the Holy Ghost being in your life, being in your heart, but trying to do these things. If your parenting style is, I can't wait till my kids get older so they'll turn out better. I can tell you, if you don't do anything right now, I can tell you, your five-year-old, what that kid's going to be like at 15. All right? And I'm also a chaplain in the jails. I'll be able to visit them later. You, you understand that. So here, he's giving people, now understand this is that Paul's giving this. This is, <laughs> this is a good group of people here that 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 he's instructing that this is all brand new to them i mean the gentiles were pagans they were heathens this is just all they knew you see that's one of the things that that i cut my teeth on the children's ministry when i got involved in church and i and i was serving in my church i said i'm gonna go teach in the children's ministry uh, carnally i thought that was a really easy ministry because these are just kids and i can you know i, I was told you can't hit kids but you can make them flinch. Uh, just they gave me certain little guidelines there. But man, these kids are rough, man. They wanted to know the Word of God. And uh, so I, I had to study the Word of God. I just thought it was going to be like babysitting and, until I went through children's training. I was like, I'm going to give them the Word of God here. And so here I got to see firsthand parents who just not involved whatsoever in their kids' life. Uh, they just go to church, have a soulish experience, and there's nothing all, there's nothing all week long uh, in their lives. And then I, I witnessed and seen parents, uh, or I could witness from the kids, First and Second Timothy and Titus. First and Second Timothy and, and Titus. Now listen, if the world, if the world can tell that a, a 10, 12-year-old in Little League Baseball is going to be a major league baseball player, they... Scouts are scouting little league teams. They can tell what kids got talent, what dad or mom is working with this kid. They can see the skills in them. They're developing, and they're going to be a major league player someday. If the world can scout that out, if the world can see that for monetary gain, listen, God's word tells me I can see First and Second Timothy and Titus in these kids' lives, and those are the people that I decided to hang out with after church. I looked at their kids. I saw how their kids were. I knew who I was going to stay away from and who I was going to hang with. And I wanted to get to know these parents. Being a single man, I realized someday if I was ever going to have intimacy with a woman that I would need to be married as a Christian to be married and it should be a Christian woman. And there was a high probability that uh, we were going to be pregnant. Now, I'm old school. I'm pretty sure my wife was going to be the one with the kid, right? So, and then these things are going to, then that means I'm going to be a father. And they don't have father schools and give you licenses to be fathers, so you just, they can have it. So I better find out how these marriages and how these other families are operating. And I simply just cased the children's ministry just like I did on any job as a criminal I cased it out, I sought it out, I made my plans, and I looked at it like a criminal. I'm a Christian now, so I use my powers for good, right? I said, I want to hang out with these people. Because I know kids just don't turn out this way. Just, <laughs> it, I, I use this example that, that your kids, my kids, just right there, are, we have to tell them to share, no child ever just goes, they're cur- unless they have a certain, uh, some genes missing, some things in their brain, and they have a, some type of disease that just, they have no inhibitions whatsoever, and uh, that's that. I don't, there's none of those people here, I can just tell you that. 
So we're told to share. We're told to be this way. But just saying, well, I just hope they grow up and they get mature and they figure these things out. That's up to you and I as parents. So I looked at First and Second Timothy and Titus not as I'm going to be a pastor someday, I'm going to serve. I'm like, I'm going to be a father. What do I do? Because I, I am like these pagans. This is all new. I had, all I had was pagans behind me, raising me, or not raising me and being there. So I'm like, I, I, better get, I better get me some instruction here. And so in Titus chapter 2, look at the instructions that he gives here. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Doctrine means teaching. The things that are sound, the things that are steadfast, the things that are, that are sure. You can depend upon these things. It, it, it's not based on, if you're taking it, feelings. It's not based on feelings. It's not based on emotion. This is just simply the truth. This is just simply what it is. And you choose to. And that's what I enjoy about Jesus and being very direct. Jesus was never wishy-washy. And, I, and the apostles, and I see the apostle Paul, and I've seen him encouraging in Timothy. This speaks to me very directly. Sound doctrine, just what is true. No feelings involved whatsoever. You like it or you don't. It's, it, it's solely, wholly, totally dependent upon you what you will do with this information. So will speak thou these things which become sound doctrine. That's how I approach raising my children. I, I, I chose from the very, uh, very beginning. I was never going to tell them about Santa Claus. And here's the thing that I discovered in children's ministry. Here's the stuff that I seen with kids growing up. I knew everything that kids or these parents were against. That's mainly what I heard. How I am teaching today, how I am pastoring today, and how I am ministering today is because I saw what not to do in the children's ministry at my church. Because, and again... The kids who are coming are pretty much, I'm, you know, 42 years in the Lord now, so I'm old, that whole Jesus people, revolutionary, so it, it, it's, it's all new. And so I'm growing up with all these people who are just trying to figure out, you know, how to be a parent now. And the, 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 the thing to do is, well, we're against this, we're against that, we're against this. I've never instructed my kids what we're against. I never told my kids we're against Halloween we're against Santa Claus. We're against those things. I just never told them about Santa Claus or Halloween. Never told them. I just said, but this is what we're about. And then I watched every one of my children and it started to dawn on them when people would say, hey, what are you going to dress up from Halloween? They're like, what's Halloween? And my kids would come back at seven, eight, nine years old. Dad, have you heard of this thing called Halloween? Like, yeah. Well, this, I guess this has been going on for a long time. How come we've never seen it? I said, because we're usually going to the movies that night. I just removed ourselves from the situation. But then they're getting an age when their kids, are, the other kids are saying, they're, what are you going to dress up for Halloween? They're like, what is that? And I kid you not. I mean, my oldest son, the first one, he's like eight years old. He's, and I, I remember a kid at church talking to him. And I, and I said, son, Kevin, what were they talking about? Because here was my son, mo, you know, has mannerisms like me, like me, and he's just sitting there, and he's just looking into his eyes, and my son's just going, and he just comes over, and he goes, so what's up? That? And he go, I go, what's up? And he goes, he's trying to tell me about this thing called Halloween, and they're dressing up. And again, he goes, and I just look, and I go, it, it sounds like you're for Satan. It doesn't sound like anything about Jesus. And he goes, oh, it's about make-believe and pretend and He's like, tell me more. And every time this kid would tell him more, he's like, that just sounds weird. I mean, where's that in the Bible? You see, no one ever convinced my kid about evolution or these things or question or deconstruct their faith. They're like, so run that by me again? And then to watch my next kid run seven or eight, the same thing, and then watch my you know, next child around seven, eight, the, the, the same thing, and they're all like, of course, my youngest one learned from the other ones, and so we're in a mall, She's about four years old. And again, I got in trouble. This, someone said, be careful, chick, how you present this. So I'm going to try to present it in such a way. But there was a man who had a, a longer white beard than mine in a mall, all dressed up in red, and went up, because I never said anything to her, went up to her and says, little girl, would you like to sit on my lap and tell me what you want for Christmas? My daughter comes running to me and says, Dad, there's a freaky guy over there. He wants me to sit on it. I don't know who that is. Who is that? And then my boys are all like, 
They're, they're eight and seven. Like oh, we, were, we learned that years ago when we were little. <laughs> and they go, this is Santa Claus. And my daughter, not, not joking, she, she didn't know yet how to joke that she goes, Satan Claus? <laughs> I mean, she's all on her own. We didn't prep her, didn't prime her. And they go, no. And so my boys are trying to explain to her what Santa Claus is and this whole thing. And, and because what other kids at church have been telling them and what they've heard in the neighborhood, and she walks over to them, as only a four-year-old can say in, in the way the four-year-old can talk, she, right in, the, in this mall, she goes, I'm not going to sit on your lap. You're a joke. You're fake. You're not even real. But you see, there's a bunch of other kids waiting to sit on this man's lap and to get their pictures, and they all start crying. And then all the parents are looking at me, and like, and I go, what's your point? You see, because my oldest boy was four or five years old, and my mom was visiting us for Christmas, and she would go outside to get some fresh air, smoking. And my son would go with her, and she would come back. She says, I'm upset. Your son... Your son, your son told me that there's no Santa Claus. I'm like, what's your point? I, I go, Mom, I'm sorry. I, uh, did you not know this? <laughs> I mean, we knew this, all these things were... Now, I think you believed there was a Santa Claus because we grew up poor, and for some whatever reason, you saw a lot of presents under the tree, and you never bought us anything. I mean, those got there somehow. And our family, you just figure out how they got there. And, and she goes, no, I can't believe you. You're the whole spirit of Christmas. The spirit of Christmas is that Jesus wasn't even born in December, but we chose to say that's his birthday. And we celebrate the one who gave his life for us by giving gifts to everyone else and going broke. So she takes him for another walk. Hours later, she comes back. She goes, your, your son. What? And he goes, he asked me to stop smoking okay, I've asked you too. And she goes, no, he wanted me to stop smoking because smoking kills, and if I die, I would go to hell. <laughs> Mom, this is going to be a tough night for you. There is no Santa Claus, and there is a hell. You've got these things switched. What is your point? She goes, I can't believe the things that you're ruining these kids for. I said, well, I've just chosen to never lie to my children. I made that decision because, you see, I look at First and Second Timothy, I look at Titus, and I vowed that I knew I was going to get me married someday. I had a goal. I don't want to leave you hanging, but I got married, all right? And knew we were going to have kids, knew we were going to do these things. So I said, well, I've, I've seen all these kids from all this generation of my age who've gotten married and they're having kids, and they're, they're, they're quite a few years ahead of me of having kids. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to raise my kids up and learn about everything that I'm against. And that's also sometimes the same way that people learn in Christianity. Is they might come to church and how they're taught is we're against this, we're against that, we're against this. I'm like, how about just simply teach the truth and then let that guide and direct your life? I'll, if, If everyone believed the Bible who says they're a Christian and going to church, there would be no need for the welfare system in the United States of America. Because there was a time before the great war on poverty in the 60s with Lyndon Baines Johnson that people did have community in church and everybody helped each other out. It wasn't up to the government to help one another out. If everyone who goes to church who calls themselves a Christian actually voted... They're con actually voted for what the Bible says. Not, not that they're voting for a spiritual leader, but someone who's the most closely aligned with their beliefs. There would be no abortion in the United States. There wouldn't be the various crimes. There wouldn't be the various laws. There wouldn't be the various things. If everyone who says they are a Christian, just the, let's just say 174 million people in the United States who says that they are Christian or evangelic or some type of Christian faith or, and really believed that, there, there, there never would have been a Roe v. Wade. There never would have been those things if you believe that. But we know that exists today and these things happen and why? Well, let's, that's in the, in the macro. That's in the big. Let's look at the micro. Let's just look individually in our own lives. And I would challenge you 
the same way that I've still continued to be challenged is, do I know more about what I'm against or what I'm for? That's how I've chosen to raise my kids. That's how I've chosen this style of ministry, what we're doing here. And all I can do is take that which is happening around me right now and try to take God's word, because that's all Paul's doing right here in Titus. And we're going to get to that verse about what's happening right now in, in life around you. How are you living out God's word right here? So, but speak thou things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. I want that for my boys. I want that for my daughter. I want that for my kids. I want that for this church. That the aged, you can tell I'm aged, that the, that the aged would be sober. In other words, clear-minded. Not just talking sobriety. I've got so many years of sobriety. But actually that word right there of having a sound mind and of sound thinking and doing these things. And be that of, of temperate. I was not a temperate person. My wife was sharing with somebody today a time in her life when she, when, as Christians, and we were growing and learning and just things that she, she, wasn't, she wasn't given to, to peace. And this person's going, I would have never guessed that in you. I said, welcome to my life. No. <laughs> welcome to those things. Welcome to those silly arguments and things that we got into when we were young, even as Christians trying to be, trying to be mature and to work these things out. Why? Two selfish people. Mine, 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 mine. Get married now. It's ours. <sighs> well, I know that in theory, but now they really want that. <laughs> to be temperate. Sound in faith talking with somebody today and, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a conversation I've had plenty of times this week. This person's going to church and I'm saying, no, I think that person goes to churches. It's go, it goes to churches. I've had this conversation a lot this week. I'm just saying, no, I, don't, I, 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 I hope that, but I don't, I know of them, but I know that person goes to churches. They don't go to church. Let's just put it this way. It's like marriage. I go to my wife. I don't go to women. I would put it in such a way that it, it, I don't mean to be crude, but hey, you showed up. You should know what you're expecting there. I would say it, it's the equivalent to me in spiritualness because the, God uses these words as well, is that I can either go to my wife, like some people go to church, or I can go to women, which are called prostitutes. That's why God continually, all through the Old Testament, says, why do you choose to go to a prostitute? He talks about that spiritual adultery. I'm committed to my wife. I am committed to my church. I am committed to this relationship. I learned that from God's word. And so here, it would be that one of sound in faith and in charity and in patience. That, again, if, if, if we were to, is our testimony one that we would share with someone, like someone my wife shared today, like, hey, in my life I didn't have this patience or I didn't have this temperance, and I'm able to share that, and they go, oh, no, I could never see that in you. Well, then that's a testimony. Praise God that that's the way it is right now. Verse 3, so the aged, the aged women, in verse 3, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accus um, accusers, not given to much wine, Teachers of good things. We're going to cross-reference that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. And that, again, I've, I've raised every one of my children to marry young. Not to go into a dating process. That is a process of elimination. Pray and wait for the one that God has brought you. Why would you want to go out of the dating process to go six, seven failed relationships and then hopefully find the right one and then say, God brought us together? Then if God brought us together, why are you hanging out with seven other? You're going to take those broken relationships with you into that final marriage. Not why, why don't you just wait for the one that God has for you and be ready? Not waiting, but being ready. Every one of my children were, were mocked and ridiculed. Mainly, my, all of my children were mocked and ridiculed by Christians, my age, Christian parents, and their own children for the stance that my children said they wanted to be married. They wanted to be married when they're 18 and 19 year, years old. They've seen the effects. Why? Because my children have grown up where people would come to live with us and we would help them uh, get reestablished in life. And everyone who would come to live with us say, kids, don't be like me, man. I waited too long. I blew this. I did that. I wasted this. You know, and I've done all these things. One child, and again, 
and we're of age here. And in just one child, I've already paid him for this story so I can use this, but I pay all my kids royalties for their stories. That's why they're never offended. Some of you have been around when my youngest was here, and every time I'd mention her name, she'd be in the back of the sanctuary going, cha-ching, ching! So I pay my kids for these stories. But they have to listen to them, so I don't think this one's listening tonight. But, <laughs> but we were at a funeral for someone who went to go be with the Lord. And my son was there, and they were saying, so he was 16 years old. So he said, you're going to get married when you're 18? You're going to be married this? And, the, and, I, and I listened to him. As I listened to my foster brothers and sisters talking, all their kids were out on the porch, and this is after the funeral, and they're sharing, sharing their gossip and talking with one another. And then my foster sister's kid just moved in with a guy. She's 16, 17 years old. I think she just, no, she just might have turned 18. And, and my son had, had grown up with this kid, one of his cousins there, foster kids, and and. And they're just talking and they're just railing on him, laughing and joking and mocking him. And though this kid just, oh, he just waited like a sniper, man. I'm not that patient, man. I'm fixed bayonet, charge and wrap the hill, slash, 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 burn, 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 stab everybody. <laughs> but he waited there like a sniper for the shot. And we said something in, in sniper training, one shot, two kills. He did one shot and got 10 of them. It was like they all lined up. He go, and for 45 minutes, and then I could hear him in the porch, and he's really loud because all my brothers and sisters could hear it. He says, so let me get this straight. You think I should like wait till like I'm 30, go out and have sex with a lot of different women, do stuff like that, get strung out on pornography and masturbation and maybe hang out with harlots and prostitutes and do all these things, yeah, and then settle down and find a girl that I didn't hang out and do with that with. And, and marry her, and you think that this is going to work out. And they're all like, yeah. Or I could get married when I'm 18 and 19 and know who I'm going to have intercourse with and kids and a life for the rest of my life, never waking up wondering who I'm next to and how i got to chew my arm to get out of this trap, never dealing with all these other things, no diseases that will scare the penicillin back up into the syringe. None of that. I don't have to do any of that. You're saying I should wait till I'm 30 and I'm strung out on all these things and have these relationships. And then he looks over at my little cousin. He goes, cuz, that guy does not love you. He goes, because you moved in with him. And he just simply said, why? <laughs> why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? And they all were just like, wow, so you guys enjoy your lives. As for me, I'm just going to serve the Lord and trust and wait on the Lord. Two weeks later, my little cousin, uh, my niece, moved out of the house. I moved out with that guy, moved back in. And he, and he goes, let me just tell you what the Word of God says. You see, these are the things. You see, that's what verses 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and the rest we're getting in Titus is, these are the things that I want to instill in my children these are the things I am praying to my children instill in their grandchildren. If they don't, I will. Uh, and these are the things that I want to instill in people here that maybe you're just new here and you're just trying to figure these things out or maybe you've grown up in, in, in church and you've gone to churches. But he says here that the aged women, that they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, and to love their children. Love is a choice. It's not a feeling. We're not talking about romance. Listen, you need to go to Calvary Chapel, Bangor, Maine. You need to go listen to Master Mission Mate. You, you should listen to that now. It's not just for uh, married people. It's so you can be a good married person later. And if you're already married, you, sh you, you need to get these things going in your life. And so here, to teach them to choose to love their, their children, to love their husband and to love their children. Do you understand the day and age People are out for themselves. The Roman government that has dominated the whole uh, world. They're all Romans. Do, do, do you understand that, that, that people were going to houses of worship uh, for their pagan gods and part of their worship was to have intercourse with the temple prostitutes? And that was common. It was, it was, common, it was, it was commonly accepted. Then they get Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord and then someone's got to come to them. Uh, uh, bro, not good to go there anymore. What? Huh? I shouldn't, I shouldn't do that anymore? No. Um, let me help you. Uh, and then the, the women, 
to love your husbands? Do you understand in the Roman world, a woman, a wife, was there to procreate and have children. The mistress was there for the fun and entertainment. And Paul comes and says, no, 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 no. Everything you're doing with this mistress, you need to do with your wife. Huh? I marry a woman to procreate, to keep my legacy going, a wife. And then to now tell wives who are coming to church, you need to love your husbands. Huh? I'm just here to put kids out. I, there's a, and, and, and women had their own thing going with other guys. That was commonly accepted. In, and now they're, they're changing culture. You understand, culture kills Christianity. Wherever Christianity is brought, actually people get freedom. Slavery stops. Oppression with women and children stop. Uh, people get educated. They get literate. They are able to read. Uh, wherever Christianity, true Christianity is brought, not, not uh, a, a religion, but a relationship, people are liberated. Just think of, again, David Livingston going through the middle of Africa, not east to west, but I'm talking south to north, and trying to find new trade routes to get them to stop, to get them to stop kidnapping and enslaving other people from other tribes and selling them on the Atlantic coast for the Atlantic slave trade, Tra giving them a new trade routes and giving them other things to do besides, besides capturing and enslaving people. And then they're getting saved. And to tell, and to tell a chief, uh, just story after story, of just saying, chief, great, if you want to be a bishop, you want to be an overseer, you want to be a pastor, you've got 14 wives. You've got to narrow it down to one. You're going to have to take care of the others and all these kids but you're only going to be with one. Many, many came to church who were polygamous, who had many wives. But the Bible says if you're going to be a pastor, you're going to be a leader, you're going to be an overseer, you're just married to one. So, there, so the culture was changing. That's not really dominant right now. But understand as they're going in, and establishing churches and people are getting saved, there's still certain practices that are going on, and, and the Bible does not directly forbid polygamy. But it does say from the very beginning, he created Adam and Eve, not Michelle, Deborah, uh, Yvette. All, no, just Adam and Eve. And that's why Jesus said, God from the very beginning said, one man, one woman. But that's why they had to start coming up. But if you're going to be an overseer, you need to be, you need to be these things. You see, before I tell you, hey, listen, you need to narrow it down to one wife, you got to be of sound doctrine, sound faith, and of charity and patience. Th those are actually bigger issues. Not you've got too many wives. These things here, these things that you're doing, these, these are the things you got to work on. And women, we, you, forget that you might be one of the 14 wives or the three or four wives there uh, in the Roman government, in the Roman rule and stuff like that. You've got to love your husband. What? That, that wasn't a concept. Women were not raised to love their husbands. If you were going to be a wife, you knew you were entering in a contractual obligation to bear children. That's it. You could choose to be a concubine. You could choose to be a mistress. You could choose to be the, the fun and games girl if that's what you wanted. But if you chose to be a wife, well, being a wife gave them some security. You had to financially take care of them. You had to do things. So I just need a guy who... So let's look at our situation today here in America with the breakup of the family and the government taken care of. Women don't need fighters anymore. They just want lovers. They just want baby makers. They, just, they don't need because the government will give them a paycheck. They don't need a provider anymore. That's the culture that's going on in the society today. And where are the men? Men have given up. We're men that want to be providers and to do these things and to be that. And so here, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of the God may not be blasphemed. So the older teaching the younger. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. To, uh, it's okay to have a sense of humor, but that, uh, not to just be irreverent and to be living this way and, and that carefree, but to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern 
This also is where we get the word type, but a pattern of good works in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. You know, we have a church account. The email is Calvary Chapel St. Paul, Calvary Chapel St. Paul, or you get it, CCSP. And I'm constantly getting emails. Hey, CCSP, we know that you're watching pornography or illicit things and like that, and then you need to send money in and, uh, or else we're going to release it. Like, this is just a bot. This is, this is, they don't even know who they're doing it. But this week, I got an email to my private email. Somehow, after all these years, now there's like, hey, you're watching, you know, porn or you're doing these things. Send money in or else we're going to. We got your IP address. And I'm like, I don't respond to it. I hit junk mail. I report it as, as spam and move on. But I'm like, bring it on. But... But if you are watching these things, you might be suspect of those emails. I look at it and go, not me. That ain't happening. And so here, to be discreet, to be chaste, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing them corruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you. Oh, you might want to say evil things about me. But really when it comes, exhort servants to be obedient. What? Servants? Yeah. Dulos, those who, are, who, who have sold themselves into indentured servitude, and for those who are slaves, conquered people. You, you're a Christian now. We're not condoning and saying slavery should go on. But if that's the situation you're in, and we know from the other text that it says, hey, if you can gain your freedom, you should do it. There's nothing noble staying a slave. If you can get, but if you're in that situation, what's happened right there, then use this as a testimony. And that way, if you're being unfairly uh, judged and ju- these things are going on, then as your slave master will question and say, why are you this way? In the same way, if you're a prisoner, if you're a captive, that you're living your life in such a way that they're going to ask you, like, listen, I don't think you're getting the plot here. This is supposed to be evil and a bad time right now, and you're whistling while you're working. What's going on here? And you get to tell them about Jesus. So exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not prolonging, but showing all good fidelity. That word fidelity is where we get fiduciary. You have a fiduciary. You have a legal. You have an obligation to not just be morally and spiritually upright, but financially as well. You have a fiduciary responsibility and so when it comes to follow the money when it comes to that term that if they look into your accounts whatever it is whether it be money whether it be the mammon whether it be the spiritual you have i have it is expected of me as the pastor of this church to uh our books be in such an order that if anyone says you know let me see the books where's all the money being spent i'll I'll tell you what the thing that that was drilled in me of learning how to be a pastor is to make sure you, you, you don't touch the glory, don't touch the girls, and don't touch the gold. That's what I was taught. And, I, and every week when we have a financial account, and I know to where the penny is to where everything is. That if anyone ever brings an accusation, whatever, I'm like, here it is. It's all there. We put categories in everything. There's no hidden costs. If you see something, you know exactly what that's for. There's no spiritual word for it, whatever. That's what it is because I owe a fiduciary responsibility. And one of the things that I often ask people when I'm helping them, I'm helping people through financial counseling and budgeting and working in their lives. And I just ask them a simple question. If I ran my finances like you ran your finances, would you come to this church? Would you trust me to be fiduciarily responsible for these things that go on? They're like, uh, no. The answer should be no. But you'll get better at your finances. You'll be, it's my personal. And before they were the church, there was already personally in my finances. And if you look at our books right now, and if you look at my own personal finance, and I will open up. I have every tax statement and return since I was legally reporting taxes since I was 16. There's a side income that I won't talk about. But I'm a Christian now. So since I was a Christian, especially 16, and then since I become a Christian, I have all my tax returns. I have everything, every home we've had, everything like that. I keep all those records. If you want to see them, I'll show you exactly where all of the money I've earned and all the money that that has been paid to as the church, where it's all gone. I give a financial accounting for all of that. And because of that, I'm able to manage the household of God. And because of that, I'm managing four other estates for people. I'm helping them with their books and doing these things. 
I'm doing this with another church. I'm doing, I'm helping them when it comes to, there is a fiduciary responsibility. And so here, he's telling them here. And I understand why he's telling them this, because that's not common. You know, some people, because they make a lot of money, you might not see their sin of irresponsibility because they don't know where the money's going. They don't know what, what's happening with it. They just throw everything on it. And because they're not laid on bills or things, that they, there's some people who have the ability to make a lot of money. But then when they sit down and do their finances and realize there's a lot of money that's lost, that it's gone. And so here, again, that sound speech, exhort servants to be obedient unto their masters. And I understand that I'm a servant of the Lord and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not prolonging, but showing all good and uh, uh, showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, to, in all things. Just today, and I'm just, uh, again, looking at, at documentaries of, of, of churches that have, were corrupt and they're falling and they're doing these things. And I'm like, man, how could you wreck people's face and their trust that way? I mean, I just first and foremost look at my own life first and my own wife and my own kids, why I do the things that I'm doing. And it just flows over into the church. It's not the other way around. What you see here is the same thing you see. In all. It's, just, it's all there. I'm a sinner saved by God's grace. And so here, that the doctrine, that the teaching of God would be, <laughs> what? A door that people would look at and go, that guy believes what he's saying and he's living. I like as one came to an old-time preacher He's an old dead dude from about 150 years ago. Great evangelist of his time in, in the United Kingdom in London. He came up to him and said, you know, pastor, he was a drunk, me rated, and he knows who this pastor is. Pastor, 20 years ago, uh, I, I was at one of your revivals and you saved me. And the pastor looked at him and says, I, had no, I have no doubt that 20 years ago I saved you. However, if Jesus would have saved you, you would not be a drunk today. I gotta point people to Jesus. And so here, we need to exhort. And so that people says, are you living up? Listen, uh, again, I'm a sinner by, saved by God's grace. I'm a saint of God, continually being sanctified. And when things happen in my life, I'll be open, honest, and transparent with you so you can learn from others' mistakes. But I'm going to just get on the right thing. Ask my wife before getting up to teach this evening, just before coming up for worship. I said, do you like me? She's like, yeah. So, I've been hearing things today. Ooh, that's Satan. Why are you listening to him? Yeah, I, I do. Just, you know, maybe, maybe it's right or whatever. And oh, you still like me right now? All right, good deal. All right. You know, I still get the same attacks, maybe even more so than some of you, to try to get me to, well, I've never really doubted, but just, I just, just last night, uh, being in downtown St. Paul for our 114th Winter Carnival. I haven't been at all 114. I look it, but... And just sitting down and being with these young men and women and going around freezing and looking at the ice sculptures and looking at the surprise. Happy birthday. Wrong numbers are on it, but... And just, and just sitting there, and I just look at my wife and I just, just love her, and I just and I go, I, I love St. Paul. I, I truly, it's, it's cold... I love the city of St. Paul. It's my city, folks. I love St. Paul. I want everybody to come to know Jesus Christ as Savior your Lord. And there's people that are lost and dying. I get to share the gospel with people, even with the winter carnival there. And I just love the city of St. Paul. I don't like the mayor right now. I don't like our governor right now. I don't like all the governors. I don't like any of that. But I love the city of St. Paul. I just, they're going to be here. I'm just going to be here. Everyone else, I encourage you, if you can get out of Minnesota, you should probably get out of Minnesota. I'm not leaving. And, and, and so here, he tells us here, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. This is in the whole known world at the time. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You ready? Let me show you a video of our present world right now. I just want to take what we're going through and try to apply the, what's happening in, in, in Ephesus, what's happening in Galatia, what's happening in, in Rome right now. Uh, as we're reading this, the, he's encouraging them. But we're not, we're not into slavery. We're not selling ourselves into those things. These things aren't going on. 
Well, what is going on? Look at this video. You got it? And then we'll come back. How do we live today in this present world? Those who are responsible for the pandemic have used two of the weapons that the Nazis used, which was fear and propaganda. Propaganda feeds the fear, foments it, hardens it. At that time, the fear was against Jews who were accused of being spreaders of infectious disease. The thing that I realized and was horrified by was that medicine under the Nazis had been totally taken over by government. And so I realized that panic was being fomented so that people would lose confidence in their ability to discern things. And so the best way is listen to public health officials, the experts. The thing that'll get us back to the world that we had before coronavirus is the vaccine and getting that out to all 7 billion people. Bill Gates assumes the mantle of one who has authority in the medical public health field. There has never been a public health. The only health that ever existed is the individual's health. Every single medical procedure or medical practice needs to be considered with regards to how does it affect this individual patient? Is it necessary? Why did all of you cooperate? And here's the interesting answer. The Nazis never presented themselves as negative, destructive people. They presented themselves as party who is trying actually to make things better. And that's what they taught people. When you were taken to a ghetto, it was for your own protection. When you were taken to a camp, you were told we have work for you there and food and shelter. We want to help you. My grandfather, who was in the French army, he got into camps and he always feared after that normal doctors. He saw them doing all kinds of experiments on people, entering the barracks with huge syringes and things like that. There were people sent in Australia to, to camps. They didn't kill them there. but. That the process that we are going through is part of what they were doing to them. Most people just think, well, we need to do what the government says and they want what is good for us. And they trust them and they think that's the way it is. It's so scary that you can understand what happened there and that it happens again. It's a deja vu, you know, I feel exactly. I mean, people tell us what to do now. People are telling us how to do how to go, what to shop. We went like sheep in the Second World War. It's happening now all over the world with this COVID. I'm against people who are telling me what to do with my body because it's, it's a lie, it's a big lie. When people are so blind, I can't stand it. I have to, I have to try to convince them to, to, to open their eyes, to open their ears, not to go like sheep. It's a race between enslavement and expansion of global human consciousness. Because there are many, 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 many more of us. I'm advocating for nonviolent civil disobedience, an absolute rejection of all these mandates. Resist. This is a documentary just came out this week. It's four parts, uh, Never Again Global. You can look at it on uh, Children's Defense uh, Network. It's not going to be on YouTube, by the way. <laughs> uh, you have to go for there as a documentary. But that's our present state. This is where we're in right now. Well, let me give you the hope it is right here. I'll give you the same thing the Apostle Paul gave, verse 13 of Titus 2. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you looking for the Antichrist or are you looking for Jesus? 
Because the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the revelation of the Antichrist. It just tells us if everyone else will be left behind, what's going to happen to them? And things will get tough here in the United States. Why is it that we're not part of the climate accords? President Trump got us out of that. That was totally fake. It's already been proven. He said everything about Ukraine, what was happening there. But why is our governor this week going to sign a bill into law? Elections have consequences. That, uh, that no other, uh, America is not in the climate control, but why is Minnesota, why is our governor want to be the first state in the nation by 2020, everyone's, it's 2050, but by 2024, we're all done with fossil fuels and the carbon emissions. You see, the, the House and the elections is controlled by one party right now. And they're just going to pass all these things. If the Christians who say that they're Christians who believe in the Bible, those people shouldn't be in office because they're not vote, they're, that, that they don't match up to what I'm describing here. If, if people say that, yeah, we're Christians, then there wouldn't be in it. In other words, you can have all the abortion clinics you want. No one would be going to them. Here in the Midwest, if you look at the spiritual revivals that were going on when uh, Finney and Whitehood, uh, Whitehead and all these others would come through and Moody would come through and preach the gospel. Whole small little towns would get saved. The brothels would close. The bars would close. The sheriffs would have to lay off people. There's just no crime going on here. Pray for our teachers. Watched a horrible video, another one, of a ninth grader beating up her teacher. You know, in my day, if I talked back, I was an outstanding student. I was sent to go stand outside of the principal's office. But to tolerate? Broke the teacher's leg. This is a common, I pray for our teachers who are in the state of Minnesota who are saying that our governor wants to pass legislation that they have to affirm the binary, transgender, and pronouns and all those things if they want to keep their teaching license. That's why, again, I was raised as a Christian scientist, uh, so a uh, really weird religion, but we didn't believe in going to doctors or my Mom did. I probably would have been for it. But we grew up with all these home remedies. How come those home remedies aren't even given out anymore? I mean, I, I've got ways to help you with sunburns. I know how to clear, or clear up athlete's foot. We'll talk later. I got all these home remedies and all these things that we grew because whenever we go to the doctors, stuff that was uh, across the prairie, uh, stuff that uh, we've been taught to the pioneers and all stuff that they had because there was no doctors. How do you do that? Do you know with a cup of sugar I can, I'll, I can heal a knife wound? With sugar. There's a thing that I can actually use maggots. I can use all these other things that I knew how to do that. I also know how to extract a bullet and do a bullet hole. And today it's easier because now they've got this crazy glue. It seals up. I don't have to do stitches. I'm not trying to tell you how not to go to the doctors if you're doing something illegally. You should go to the hospitals if you've got a bullet hole in you. But I mean, I, I grew up knowing all this stuff because we didn't go to the doctors or report to the police. I knew how, to, I got scars all over me with these home remedies and I'm still here. And don't get me going about essentials oils. I don't know how essential they are. I'm 60. I made it this far. I'm bacon oil, bacon grease. That's my essential oil. But looking for our blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Not that I'm trying to escape, but I know that's going to happen someday and I want people to come with me who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke. <gasps> you might have to tell somebody they're wrong. Rebuke with all authority and let no man despise you because the word of God is the authority. But they're going to hate you. They're going to persecute you. They're not going to like it. But it's the word of God. But make sure that it's the word of God. Make sure it's the word of God that we're going to. It's the same way that I've raised my children. It's like, listen, this is, this, is, this is how we kind of do it in our family. This is what I'm applying in God's word. But it might not work with a different family. But this is how we roll. And then people will say, your boys can do whatever they want to their hair, but your little girl, you make her grow her hair long. Because I know when she's out of my house, she can shave it all and pierce every earlobe and do all this stuff, but I just want a little girl. And they go, isn't that a double standard, Pastor? Absolutely. My boys, I have a standard for them, and a girl, I'm old school, I have a standard for her. My wife wanted to get her ears pierced. I wanted her to wait till she was married. Kimberly's got her ear pierced, and we're going to do these things. We're going to pierce. All right. 
And I would make sure I tell my kids, this isn't Jesus telling you, this is me. This, this is what I want. This is how we roll in our family. But you know what? You go married and you can have kids yourself. You can, you can do it right. You can show me up. You can show me up. But I can tell you this. I just, I want to instill this into my kids, my grandkids, and in you, the congregation. Make sure people are offended because of the Word of God and what God's Word says. Not some tradition, cultural thing. All right? And if you don't know by now, going to orgies are bad. That's what Paul had to say. And guys like you would sit in church and even go, orgies are bad. What? Could you? I mean, it seems odd to say that right now, right? But that's the messages Paul would have to go in and talk to people and say, that's bad. All these people, boys and girls together, all having sex together. If, you th- if that grosses you out, talk to your mom and dad. They put you in this class. <laughs> and we're off Bible radio, right? Oh, we're not? That went out live? Okay, Lord Jesus, thank you for tonight. <laughs> and Jesus, what was the whole countdown for? I thought I was clear on that one. All right, Lord Jesus. Just ask you to help everyone who's traumatized tonight. In the name of Jesus, help me, Lord. Help me and help everybody here. We just praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.